This lecture review video examines the age of absolutism, which we can date from the years 1600 to 1715, primarily the 17th century. These are key years in the history of Europe, particularly coming after the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. In fact, it's impossible to understand the age of absolutism without understanding that background of the theological conflicts and the warfare stemming from the Reformation in the previous century. Whereas many of the religious conflicts in various countries and military conflicts seem to have been resolved in a lot of these countries on a regional basis, it is clear that religious division in Europe is still resulting in warfare into the 17th century. And we see that with the emergence of the Thirty Years' War which is going to extend from 1618 to 1648. The Thirty Years' War exposes the fact that the question of religion still is not resolved in the Holy Roman Empire, despite the Peace of Augsburg, which had supposedly concluded the matter. We see the outbreak of conflict, particularly in the area of Bohemia, or what we could identify as the Czech Republic today, in the city of Prague. In the city of Prague, there was a growing group of Calvinists. You remember that the Peace of Augsburg provided for religious toleration for Lutherans and Catholics according to the wishes of the prince of each state or region, but Calvinists had not had any, been granted any religious toleration. So with the growth of this Calvinist movement in Bohemia, and particularly in the city of Prague, the Catholic emperor, the Habsburg emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, endeavors uh, to squelch them and uh, eliminate them as a presence in his kingdom. And so when the emperor sends representatives to Prague, they are met by local authorities, local Calvinist authorities. And after a disagreement, these representatives of the emperor are thrown out of the window or what can be called uh, they are defenestrated, which means to be thrown out of a window. This is the defenestration of Prague of 1618, in which these Catholic representatives are thrown from the tower of the Prague Castle. Fortunately for them, there was a large pile of manure that caught and broke their fall not too far below. Um, and so they gave credit to the Virgin Mary for protecting them. The Protestants gave more credit to the pile of manure. But in any case, the emperor looks upon this injustice and this indignity of his ministers being thrown out of a window to launch a war against the Calvinists in his kingdom. We can divide up the Thirty Years' War into four stages, four phases, if you will. And what we see in the first phase is centered primarily in Bohemia, in which the Catholic Habsburg emperor endeavors to invade and crush the Calvinists which indeed he is largely successful in doing and driving out some of the local Calvinist princes in the first Bohemian phase. In the second phase, Denmark gets involved in the war as fellow Protestants, as Lutherans, in an effort to protect their fellow Lutherans in the empire, but also in the interest of the broader cause of Protestantism, endeavor to invade the Holy Roman Empire. This is a failed invasion, and the emperor and his capable general are unable to destroy the Den Danish forces that invade the empire, and now the Calvinists lose even more freedoms of religion that they uh, had enjoyed before. In response to the Danish failure, the Kingdom of Sweden also gets involved under the very capable military commander and their king, Gustavus Adolphus. Gustavus Adolphus invades the empire, and he is successful in defeating the imperial army. However, Gustavus Adolphus himself is killed in the conflict. This leads to some religious freedoms for Calvinists in the empire, but it is clear that the empire, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, is very divided on the questions of religion and politics, and now international forces are invading and picking apart parts of the empire. And so this leads us to the fourth phase of the war, which we can call the French phase or the Franco-Swedish phase, in which France takes advantage of the weakness of the Holy Roman Empire to grab more land for itself, grab more resources, and to extend its power on its eastern border. What is very significant about French involvement in the Thirty Years' War is that the Kingdom of France allies itself with Sweden. Sweden. 
In other words, for the first time, we see here a Catholic power allying itself with a Lutheran or Protestant power. What this signals is that the Thirty Years' War represents a transition of the end of the Reformation and the beginning of a new century, a new age of uh, where dynastic and national and monarchical concerns are greater than religious concerns, because here the Catholic French are allying, the, allying themselves with the Lutheran Swedes, and together they defeat the empire, and France stands to gain quite a bit because of this alliance, which it indeed does. By the terms of the peace treaty outlined at Westphalia, this is the Peace of Westphalia of 1648. As a result of the peace treaty, all the German states now gain the freedom to choose their own religion, not just uh, Lutheran and Catholic states. France wins uh, significant tracts of land as a result of the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, there's a new level of independence among the German states in the Holy Roman Empire. The Habsburg Empire himself is reduced to a figurehead. And once again, political motives, national concerns are much more important than religious divisions. Most significant, perhaps, about the Peace of Westphalia is that the Pope is not invited to these proceedings and is ignored in all of these deliberations. That, of course, marks a major switch from the medieval period in which the ecclesiastical power often uh, trumped temporal or earthly powers. In other words, the Pope was always more powerful and more significant than uh, the kings of various European states. Now, it is clear that monarchs across Europe are extending their influence and their power over their own kingdoms and over their own dynastic and international concerns and leaving the Pope on the sidelines. Uh, that is one of the biggest legacies of the Peace of Westphalia of 1648. The war is immensely devastating for the German states, for Holy Ro the Holy Roman Empire. Some have likened it to the devastation after the Second World War for Germany as well. Thus, after 1648, this is what the map of Europe looks like with a growing, emerging international power in France, a strong but certainly weakened power in Spain after the disastrous um, attempt to launch the Spanish Armada, still a fragmented Italian peninsula without a uniform Italy, also, fragmented German states that are more divided than ever and with a weak uh, Habsburg emperor who moves his focus and his concerns away from the German states and more east to his uh, in ancestral lands of Austria. For a brief moment of time, there is a strong Polish-Lithuanian kingdom uh, to the northeast and then the strong Lutheran powers uh, and Scandinavia, Tsardom of Russia to the east, also the Ottoman Empire, and also uh, England in the North Sea. This is what the map of Europe looks like after roughly a century of religious conflict. Very destructive wars fought between Catholics and Protestants, particularly devastating for France and for Germany and for other Europe, other areas of Europe as well. So therefore, after the end of the Reformation, which particularly for the continent, we can date the end of the Reformation at 1648 with the Treaty of Westphalia, we see the emergence and the desire for a new type of government that confines the majority of power and influence and control in a European state to the monarch. And this is what we mean by the concept of absolutism, giving absolute power to the king in order to prevent religious divisions, religious wars. The religious wars are too destructive. The death count is too high. It is too destructive for the economy. Uh, <clears throat> it is uh, not wise to give regional power to nobles, but rather confine and centralize power to the central monarch. So the question that we can examine and think about for the remainder of this unit in this century is to what degree did absolutism take hold in each of the European states? And as we shall see, it is clear that there are some European states in which absolutism does seem to prevail. There are other states that there is a conflict and efforts by the monarch to be absolute, but is often held in check by a parliament or a group of nobles.
And then there are also states that we could call limited monarchies, where clearly, despite the, perhaps the attempt of some of its monarchs, absolutism is not achieved and established in these states, and the power of the monarch is limited by a constitution or a parliament. So if we wanted to identify a birthplace for this concept of absolutism, we may see it in France. And certainly France, under Louis XIV, will be the best example of an absolutist state in 17th century um, that we, we can witness in Europe. This is not surprising we would see this emerge in France, as France was particularly torn apart by the French wars of religion that last almost a half a century with the explosion of conflict between the Huguenots and the Catholic monarchy uh, aided by the Catholic League in France. is widespread uh, destruction in France, and there was also a perception that the monarchy had been very weak during the French wars of religion, and so now, in order for France to take its rightful place in the world, they need to, uh, we need to establish a strong absolute monarchy. Some of these ideas are advanced by Louis XIV's own chaplain and bishop, Bishop Jacques Bousset, uh, in his work Politics Drawn from the Very Words of Holy Scripture. He identifies from the Bible that absolutism is the most biblical form of government, to have one king and all authority invested in the king. To the objection, what if the king is corrupt or abusive, Bousset says the people have no recourse to resist the king. That would be a Huguenot idea. What is important is that the people obey the king. If the king is corrupt and abuses his power, God himself will punish the king, and you should leave it to God to let him keep the king in check. This often uh, le left little consolation for those who are rather unhappy with the tyranny that they chafed under uh, in France and other European states. So in France in the 17th century, the prevailing dynasty is, of course, the House of Bourbon. We've already talked about Henry Bourbon, who was the King of Navarre, the leader of the Huguenots, who finally, at the end of the French Wars of Religion, inherits the throne and therefore converts to Catholicism to gain the support of Paris and other cities. But he does issue the Edict of Nantes, which provided 20 free cities for the Huguenots to arm themselves and also to worship freely. Ascending to the throne in 1572, Henry Bourbon becomes Henry IV. His son is Louis XIII, and his son is Louis XIV, the prime figure of the age, the most powerful, most influential uh, and probably the most absolutist monarch of the 17th century. Because Louis XIII exercises uh, little influence uh, initially uh, as, uh, as king, and because Louis XIV is only about five years old when he ascends to the throne, they are assigned regents. These regents will help the young king rule. So these two very significant regions are two cardinals, Cardinal Richelieu and also Cardinal Mazarin, and they are both worth uh, looking at uh, individually. Cardinal Richelieu is definitely one of the prime figures of the age. He really takes the absolutist ideas of Jacques Poussouet and implements them. He is strengthening the monarchy even as there is a child on the throne of France. He particularly strengthens the monarchy by reducing the power of the Huguenots, uh, raising taxes, uh, reforming the government, uh, and particularly conducting a military siege of La Rochelle, which is on the west coast of France and, a, and the prime Huguenot stronghold. Uh, they lease siege to the city and wipe out a lot of the Huguenot population there or force them to convert or force them to emigrate to different countries. Cardinal Mazarin is also a very important regent for Louis XIV, um, in Louis's junior years, he was a papal legate who was mentored by Richelieu and also increases taxes to fight wars. Uh, very significant that we do see some resistance to absolutism and the encroaching authority of the monarchy expressed through Richelieu and Mazarin in a series of rebellions. These rebellions are known as the Fronde. 
the Fronde were often groups of nobles, uh, either nobles of the robe, these are nobles who inherited their, uh, that are purchased their position as uh, a duke or a count, and the nobles of the sword, these are nobles who had inherited their position as a duke or a count. And so we see these, there's rioting in the streets, sometimes some um, minor attacks against royal officials and palaces. And in fact, Louis XIV, as a child, uh, he, when he is in his bedroom, uh, some members of the Fronde actually break into his bedroom and threaten his life before they are quickly subdued. So needless to say, this attack and these rebel rebels uh, of the Fronde uh, leave a lasting imprint on Louis, and he is determined for the rest of his life to curtail the power of the nobles and accentuate his own power as king. So Louis XIV, ascending to the throne in 1643, he will become for a long time the long longest reigning European monarch. He's going to reign from 1643 all the way to 1715, and he earns this moniker of the Sun King. The Sun, of course, is the center of the universe, the center of attention. Louis was uh, inclined to also declare la tête c'est moi, which means I am the state, I am France. Uh, there is no distance between me and France, and so whatever I declare for the country, uh, that is exactly what has happened. It's the consummate summary, terse statement of what absolutism was. So we can see the manifestation of absolutism in Louis XIV's France through several different categories, through his changes in reform of the government, in the economy, in culture, also military reforms, his policy towards the aristocrats, and also his religious policy towards the Catholic Church as well as the Huguenots. So we see his imposition of absolutism in the French government with the establishment of intendants. Intendants were spies that would go throughout the country and report back to the king. Louis promotes this idea of being God's representative on earth. And Louis, accentuating his power as an absolute monarch, never calls the Estates General. The Estates General is the French Parliament that provided some representation, some voice in government from the people. Louis never has this institution called. As a result, for a long time, the Estates General will not meet. The next time it will meet is in 1789 when the French Revolution is breaking out and France is bankrupt and there's a major national crisis. Louis XIV, although he is a devout Catholic, extends his authority over the Catholic Church, promotes Gallicanism. This is similar to Henry VIII's Anglicanism. Whereas, the, um, whereas Louis really doesn't kick the Pope out of France, he does curtail the power of the Pope, emphasizing French traditions and establishing um, the Paris Foreign Mission Society to spread Catholicism, and certainly asserts his crown over that of the Pope in France. We also see a new brutal repression of the Huguenots. The Edict of Fontainebleau in 1685 revokes the Edict of Nantes. So this document, which had been issued by Henry IV at the end of the last century, and had finally brought some peace and end to the French Wars of Religion, and had established these 20 free cities in which the Huguenots could freely worship and arm themselves, is now revoked. Therefore, Protestants who rejected a conversion to Catholicism were forcibly baptized. Often their churches, hymn books, and Bibles were burned. Uh, quite frequently, the king would send the Dragonades into Huguenot homes to live with the Huguenots, to spy on them, intimidate them, and force them to convert or to flee the country. And as a result, somewhere between five and 7,000 Huguenots, some of the most talented, industrious, entrepreneurial India, uh, uh, citizens of France leave the country and they go to North America uh, in the English colonies, particularly in the Carolinas. We also see an attention to absolutism in the French economy. Louis XIV is aided by a very capable finance minister in Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who is the Minister of Finances, he promotes this economic concept known as mercantilism. Mercantilism was 
Again, this idea that there is a mother country and it must establish colonies. The colonies provide raw materials to the mother country, which the mother country produces into manufactured goods. And the prime medium of wealth is gold, and therefore nations should gather, hold, retain gold uh, as a means of wealth. Mercantilism, of course, will eventually be replaced by commercial capitalism in the following century, uh, whereas goods and services become the means uh, in the standard of wealth rather than simply gold or silver. So uh, Jean-Baptiste increases taxes, but also made the collection of taxes uh, more uh, efficient. He promotes industries uh, and some manufacturing as well. And even though the state is collecting more money, Louis spends so much money on warfare that he is often uh, running France into uh, bankruptcy. Louis believed the best way to accentuate his power at home and his absolutist rule were through military campaigns. As a result, he launches and is responsible for initiating three major wars, including a war against the Dutch, the war of the League of Augsburg, and also the War of Spanish Succession. Dramatically expanding the army, he has the largest army in Europe and uh, retains a standing army, which was uh, quite unusual for the time. Louis also demonstrates his influence and power through culture. And the best example of that, of course, is the construction of the Palace of Versailles. Versailles was a hunting lodge that his father initially had created as a small settlement that Louis, of course, uh, with great expense, increase in taxes, uh, expands, and this become, this palace becomes the envy of all of Europe, with its various famous rooms, including the Hall of Mirrors, uh, which is a very important room uh, for subsequent historical uh, events. Also, the very famous gardens uh, throughout um, the kingdom, uh, the war room, the peace room, also, the king's bedroom, the queen's bedroom, and Louis XIV's famous chapel. And, of course, the grounds of Versailles are very large and lavish, famous also for its fountains. Uh, what we should note about the Palace of Versailles, of course, nobles are often required to come and live at Versailles. That is, of course, part of Louis's strategy to keep an eye on them and prevent them from rebelling against him. Uh, and as a result, the nobles are partying and living in luxury and uh, gambling. There's a very promiscuous, indulgent uh, culture, a lot of drinking, even some drugs uh, occurring at Versailles. Uh, and of course, meanwhile, the um, lower classes and working classes are suffering quite a bit and really burdened by extensive taxation and often struggling for food while so many are living in luxury at Versailles. At Versailles, we see uh, two interesting events with, with the affair of the poisons, in which there is a rash of people being poisoned at Versailles that leads uh, to a crackdown on activities throughout the palace and investigations, and also the famous case of the man in the iron mask, this prisoner, who many believe is secretly the uh, correct heir to the throne and not Louis. Louis has a very long reign. He has uh, two marriages uh, that produce him numerous children. He also has um, very many mistresses as well. And his reign is so long that he outlives his son, outlives his grandson. And so it is his great-grandson, the Duke of Anjou, who will become Louis the Fifteenth in 1710 upon Louis XIV's death. Louis's mistresses are particularly famous uh, for their conspiring and for their uh, jockeying for power and influence over the king, particularly with the Marquis de Montespan and also the Marquis de Maintenon, who um, uh, probably secretly married uh, the king before he died. So France is probably the best example, if there is indeed an absolute state in Europe in the 17th century, it is probably centered in France. But there are many other monarchs who, to some degree, have absolute control or are certainly reaching for absolute control over their states. We see that in Spain as well. 
Spain still has the largest empire in the world in 1600, but 1588 is a really great date to mark the beginning of the decline of Spain. It was already overextended, and now with the defeat of the Spanish Armada, clearly they are in decline. So there are numerous problems in Spain, including that they are near, nearly bankrupt, their armed forces are out of date, inefficient government, suppressed peasantry, weak commercial class, decadent nobles, corrupt and lazy clergy, and the state can't be reformed. So Philip IV indeed does have absolute control over Spain, but there's not much worthwhile in having control over because it is certainly a weakened state. On, on a different note, and on a much different trajectory than Spain, is Prussia. Prussia emerges in the northeast of the German states of the Holy Roman Empire as gradually one family, the Hohenzollerns, combine several of their lands with neighboring kingdoms and start to form this emerging state in Prussia. We can um, identify Frederick William the Great as one of the most significant electors in forming this state under this new dynasty, the Hohenzollern dynasty. Uh, and what is the focus of Frederick William is particularly the army. And the way that he attracts a lot of noble support to his cause is placing aspiring nobles who would otherwise be seeking to control the monarchy, put them in the military, allow them to perform drills and uh, wear shiny uniforms and so forth, and therefore they'll be loyal to the monarch. And that's exactly what he does. Um, although this affects the peasant class very little. So Prussia is certainly an emerging kingdom in the 17th century with the Hohenzollern dynasty. We also see this with Austria, the Habsburgs, which exercise enormous control over so much of Europe at the beginning of the 16th century, particularly with the empire of Charles V, now have been significantly reduced. That empire has been divided up and uh, the Habsburg em Emperor is significantly weakened as a result of the Thirty Years' War. And as already stated, although he exercises a lot of control over the German states, the Habsburg Emperor really focuses on his lands to the east, particularly Austria and increasingly areas like Moravia and also Hungary. So at this point in the 17th century, we can start to speak more of Habsburg, Austria, uh, rather than so much of the Holy Roman Empire. The key figure here is Leopold I, who is instrumental in expanding the ancestral lands of Austria and really making Austria the center and the focus of the Habsburg kingdom. Uh, his a very elaborate palace inspired by Versailles was the Schönbrunn, uh, located in Versailles. So what we see uh, with the Habsburgs is an attempt to expand the empire and create absolutist control, but always the problem for uh, the uh, Habsburg Austria is the mixed nationalities. There are so many different ethnic groups, including Czechs and Slavs and Hungarians and Romanians and Slovenians and Kosovars and Serbs and Jews and Russians uh, that don't necessarily uh, get along pretty well, and it leads to a lot of fragmentation in the empire. In Russia, to the east, we also see the emergence of a strong centralized monarchy. It can be debated whether or not indeed it is an absolutist monarchy in the vein of Louis XIV, but it is certainly very strong. The, the uh, Much of the credit for the emergence of the strong central monarchy could go to Ivan IV, one of the first individuals to actually claim the title of Tsar. He makes Moscow really the center, the capital of a new Russian empire, throwing off the Mongol yoke, beating back the uh, Mongol invaders from the east, establishing Moscow as the center of power in this new emerging Russian empire, and uh, using force and violence and intimidation to uh, reinforce and augment his rule. Ivan IV commissions a very famous St. Basil's Cathedral in Red Square, and as a measure of his violence, uh, orders the sack of Novgorod, uh, destroying uh, the city in Russia that he was jealous of their commercial interests, 
and their lack of dependency on him. Another good example of Ivan's strength and power is his willingness to even kill his own son. Uh, he is responsible for beating to death his pregnant daughter-in-law, who he said was dressing immodestly. And then when his son endeavors to defend his now deceased wife, his father uh, strikes him with a pointed spear, and it leads to his son's death as well. So after the death of Ivan IV in Russia, we see this time in Russian history that is often called the time of troubles. A time of troubles in Russian history is this time in which there's instability. There's not a strong monarch. These are not times that the Russian people particularly like or enjoy. They like strong leadership. So after several years of instability and conflict among the boyars, the nobles of Russia, finally the Zemsky Sobor, which was this national assembly, mostly of nobles and clergy, elect Michael Romanov, and this inaugurates the beginning of a new and significant dynasty, the Romanovs, which will be the last and one of the most enduring dynasties in Russian history. In fact, the Romanov dynasty will not conclude until 1917 with the Russian Revolution. So Michael Romanov is significant as the first Romanov. He's followed by Alexis I. Alexis I is known for his subjugation of the Cossacks, who are these bands of warriors that roam the steppes of Russia uh, and really represent uh, a threat to the centralized power of the monarch. Alexis I is very significant, uh, particularly for his marriages and then also his heirs. Alexis has two wives. One was Maria Miloslavskaya, and the second being Natalia Nereshkina. The child of the first marriage is Ivan V, and therefore the heir to the throne. After uh, Fyodor III originally inherits the throne, then Ivan V. But Ivan V uh, is born with several mental and physical handicaps, and therefore his younger sister, Sophia, exercises a lot of influence over him. Alexis' second marriage to N Natalia Nereshkina produced Peter who eventually will become a uh, czar of Russia and Peter the Great. And so it is Ivan V and Peter I who, as really young boys, rule Russia under the thumb and influence of their sister, Princess Sophia. Eventually, when Ivan dies, Sophia is removed from power and Peter asserts, asserts his authority over the monarchy. Now, Peter is very different than most heirs to the Russian throne and most Russian royalty. Peter is quite turned off to the old traditions and the old-fashioned ways of the Russian court. Therefore, he more or less grows up in the German quarter of Moscow. This was an area of Moscow with a lot of foreigners, and therefore he becomes very attracted to all things European and realizes how far behind Russia is compared to the rest of the world, particularly Europe. Peter is also a very adventurous boy. He creates his own army, and they would have standing armies and so forth, um, showing his imperial aspirations. And then he finally ascends to the throne in 1682, becoming Tsar of Russia and... Uh, absolutely one of the most consequential czars in Russian history. Peter had a fascination with the sea from a young age, his concern uh, with sailing and navigation. He was forced to marry a woman named Eudoxia Lupokina uh, at a young age. She will produce him uh, several children, most of who will die in infancy, uh, but it will also produce him his only male heir, Alexis. Peter the Great grows bored with Eudoxia and eventually sends her to a convent in Russia so that he can spend more time with his mistresses. Peter, fascinated by the West, conducts a famous trip to the West known as the Grand Embassy, in which he travels to Baltic ports, German cities, Holland, England, Vienna. He works as a carpenter in a Dutch shipyard. He uh, learns about urban planning in Manchester. He recruited Western military and naval engineers. He's fascinated by medicine and engineering and uh, all things nautical in the West. Uh, often traveling incognito, he didn't want people to know who he was so that he could learn the ways of Europeans. And then he returns to Russia and begins a wide-scale modernization of Russia. He imposes the very famous beard tax. The beard tax was designed uh, 
uh, to discourage old ways and old traditions. He felt that beards made Russians look old fashioned and he wanted them to be clean shaven like a lot of Europeans. He prohibited the traditional Russian robe of the Kafkans, prohibited arranged marriages, wanted to bring Russia into the, seven, into the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, promoted mercantilism, wrote a book of etiquette, being embarrassed by his fellow Russians as he traveled to Europe. He, uh, he is the creator of the Russian Navy, also offered new freedoms for women, created the first newspapers in Russia, and required education for the children of nobles. He also had Russia coin its first, uh, develop its first mint to uh, coin, uh, develop coins, and also introduced a new calendar. All of these reforms, the most famous of which is the beard tax and the forcibly cutting of beards, particularly of the clergy, uh, were designed to make Russia look more modern, to think more modern, and therefore live more modern. The best example of that is, of course, the creation of the Navy and the Admiralty, created by Peter the Great. Now, Peter the Great spends most of his reign focused on looking towards Europe, towards the West. He wants to be more like Europe, therefore he wants to get closer to Europe. The problem for Russia always is that to its north, there is no warm water port. Ports like Archangel and Murmansk freeze for many months of the year. And so Peter aspired to have a port on the Baltic Sea in which he could conduct trade with Europe. Therefore, he initiates the Great Northern War in the year 1700 against the Kingdom of Sweden and the Swedish King Charles XII. He invades the Neva region, uh, the, the Neva Delta, the Neva River is this river that comes from the Baltic Sea into Russia, and seizes this land and determines he wants to build a new city there that will be his new capital. The Swedish king responds with an invasion of Russia in 1700. And the Russian army thwarts this invasion through scorched earth policy, which is burning supplies as you retreat so the invading army can't have them, the skill of the Russian army, and also the Russian army's most famous ally, which is, of course, winter conditions. So Charles XII will be the first of several notable world leaders who will attempt to raid Russia, but yet get caught in the very famous and cold Russian winter. So, winning the Great Northern War, Peter the Great secures the Neva region delta and determines to build a city here. Of course, the problem is that much of this area is marshland and swampland, so this requires an enormous engineering expedition to create these embankments and to pump out the water and uh, to form these embankments made out of granite. Granite is not native to the region, so therefore, if you wanted to visit the city or a workman who were required to go work in the city had to bring granite with them or stone with them to build the embankments, and the result is the very notable city of St. Petersburg and the new capital of Russia. It was often called the City of the Bones because so many individuals died in the construction of St. Petersburg. There are also numerous bridges uh, crossing the Neva uh, River that goes to the city and its various canals. A couple of important sites, including the Peter and Paul Fortress, where all of the m most of the czars and the czarinas are buried. St. Isaac's Square, which includes St. Isaac's Cathedral where Peter will uh, marry his second wife. The Admiralty uh, was positioned here as the headquarters of the Russian Navy, uh, Peter's pride and joy. Also, the creation of a new palace later on, the Winter Palace, which will also be converted later to the Hermitage, the largest art museum in the world. And not too far away from St. Petersburg is the Peterhof Palace, built particularly by Catherine the Great, uh, which is one of Peter's most famous palaces, also patterned after Versailles, as was the standard in the 17th century, including a room that looked a lot like the Hall of Mirrors, and also its famous fountains uh, supplied by underwater springs um, uh, beneath ground. As Peter faces his latter years, he faces a crisis of who will be his heir to the throne. In the end, the only heir he has is from his first marriage, who is Alexei. Now, Alexei has nothing of the charisma, nothing of the style, nothing of the uh, broad range of interests that his father had. 
and is quite afraid of his father. In fact, runs away from his father as his father endeavors to train him to raise him up to be a great czar. Finally, uh, uh, Alexei is accused of committing treason against his father. He's actually tortured in prison. The death warrant for his own son is put before Peter. Peter kind of waffles and uh, is deciding what to do. And in the meantime, Alexei dies in prison, probably from the torture he had received. As a result, Peter dies without a male heir to the throne and is buried in the Peter and Paul fortress. Ironically, his second wife will become Tsarina, reign very briefly. Marta Skavranskaya, who becomes Catherine I, uh, was probably a Polish serf uh, before she married Peter. So this Polish serf girl becomes the Tsarina of Russia, reigns briefly, and then this will eventually catapult Russia into another time of troubles, very weak Tsars and Tsarinas, um, uh, at the beginning of the 18th century. Denmark and Sweden is also another example of absolutism uh, to the north. We can see uh, for a long time there are weak monarchs there, but gradually in the kingdoms of Sweden and Denmark, gradually absolutist rulers um, uh, achieve their power, one declaring absolute sovereign kings are responsible for their actions to no man on earth. We also see an absolutist kingdom to the south in the Ottoman Empire with the Sultan Suleiman I, the Magnificent, uh, always threatening the gates of Vienna, always seeking to expand the kingdom of the Ottoman Empire at the expense of Eastern Europe. In addition to the absolutist monarchs of Europe, we have some monarchies that there may be an attempt, a power grab by the monarch in, in an effort to obtain absolute control over their kingdoms, but ultimately these efforts fail. So we can identify three limited monarchies in which the power of the monarch is limited in the very brief but large Kingdom of Poland, the Dutch Republic, and also in England. So in Poland, we have a royal union of crowns between Poland and Lithuania. This is going to be a very brief moment in Polish history in which there's a large, expansive kingdom in which the surrounding powers are weaker than Poland. For much of world history, European history, the surrounding powers are stronger than Poland, take advantage of it to invade it and to oppress it. But at this very brief moment, in the beginning of the 17th century, we see a kingdom of Poland here with a monarch that is limited by the power of the Szemż. The Szemż was the Polish diet, which was controlled by the Polish aristocracy. So it is the Polish nobles that limit the power of the Polish king, a good example of a limited monarchy. We also have another one in the Dutch Republic. As a consequence of the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648, it not only ends the Thirty Years' War, but it also ends the Eighty Years' War. The Eighty Years' War was a war of independence by the Dutch to free themselves and create an independent country from the Spanish Habsburgs. As a result, the United Provinces are created into the Dutch Republic. Each province had a Stadtholder, kind of like a large landholder or a noble, for maintaining order in that area. There was a weak House of Orange that attempted to create a hereditary monarchy, but generally the Stadtholders, represented in the States General, the Dutch Parliament, limited the power of that Dutch monarchy. The Dutch Republic, however, is a very strong, growing commercial power. In fact, the center of banking in the 17th century really is Amsterdam. Population explodes uh, at the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th century. Amsterdam, famous for its canals and uh, gabled houses here, where Dutch merchants uh, not only resided, but also uh, had uh, warehouses at the top of their houses, create colonies all over the world, including the Dutch West India Company and the Dutch East India Company. Uh, they are, the Dutch are also one of the first to create a, a central bank in the Bank of Amsterdam, which would govern the nation's finances. And that this is, really is the pinnacle of Dutch influence. Many larger states, including the French, 
particularly Louis XIV, but also England, a very, in, a very jealous of Dutch influence and Dutch power um, that prevails in this century uh, dis, um, in an effort to curtail their power. Finally, we can move on to England and examine the role of absolutist theory in England. The significant dynasty in England during the 17th century is the Stuart dynasty. The 16th century, of course, was um, presided over in England by the Tudor dynasty. And we saw that the prevailing question of the Tudor dynasty in the 16th century is what religion was England going to be? Was it going to be Catholic or what is it, was it going to be Protestant? And of course, depending on the monarch on the throne, that question was answered in a different way back and forth in the 16th century. Eventually, the religious question is resolved during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I with the Elizabethan settlement, which established England as a Protestant country, particularly in the form of Anglicanism. Now, of course, Elizabeth did not have an heir. She was known as the Virgin Queen. And so as a result, the nearest heir to the throne after the childless Elizabeth was her cousin, who was also the King of Scotland, James VI. You can see from this chart how the two monarchies of England and Scotland were related. And the key figure here was the daughter of Henry VII, Margaret Tudor, who had married the Scottish King James IV. And so when we carry forward their lineage, we can see that the nearest heir to the throne was James VI. And as part of the historic Stuart dynasty in Scotland, he now brings that family of rulers, that dynasty, to England with a combination of these two dynasties, the Tudors and the, Stu uh, and the Stuarts. And so we have the establishment of the Stuart dynasty in England with James the first. He is the first king of both England and Scotland uh, uniting these two families. So the Stuart dynasty, if the prevailing question of the Tudor dynasty was what religion is England going to be Catholic or Protestant, the prevailing question of the Stuart dynasty is going to be who will exercise control of the government? Will it be the king or the parliament? So indirectly, this is a question of absolutism. Will the king have most absolute power. James I was known as the British Solomon. He spent vast amounts of wealth. Uh, he made it very clear that he believed in an absolutist monarch. He wrote the true law of free monarchies in which he asserted that the only way, the only law, the only possible way for a monarchy to be free is if indeed it is absolute. He advances this idea of the divine right of kings, that to be a king is a blessing of uh, God himself to question the king is to question God. To rebel against the king is to rebel against God. And so, therefore, this emerging group of individuals in parliament, um, uh, but particularly Puritans, approached the king with the millinery petition. This was uh, one of several petitions that we'll see during um, the Stuart dynasty in which the people represented through parliament and often Puritan interests are approaching the king asking for reforms of the church and reforms of the government. Generally, these petitions are rejected by the king and viewed as a threat to their power, and therefore the king doesn't usually countenance them and give the people or Puritans what they want. The one exception with the millinery petition is that J King James does authorize a new English version of the Bible, which is, of course, the King James Bible, commissioned in 1611. To reveal the threat that Catholics still pose in England, we can remember the gunpowder plot of 1605, in which a group of Catholic mercenaries endeavoring to uh, promote confusion in England seek to blow up the king and the parliament as it meets by stacking uh, an underground tunnel full of gunpowder. Of course, the key uh, conspirator in the gunpowder plot is Guy Fox, uh, but the plot is discovered the night before is to occur, but it does lead to new suspicions against Catholics in England and uh, new laws that repress uh, the freedoms that they may have enjoyed to worship under the Elizabethan settlement. Of course, during the reign of King James I, we have the first successful English colony in the New World with the establishment of Jamestown in 1607. 
And as we move towards the end of James's reign, it is clear that the parliament and the king are not on the same page regarding where power is to be located in the government. The king is asserting this idea of the divine right of kings, which is another form of absolutism, that he is to have absolute control over the government. But there's a growing contingent in parliament that asserts the right of the people and uh, demand a greater voice in government in the form of the parliament. And when their protests become too loud, the king will often shut them down and forbid the parliament from meat. To make the situation even worse, the parliament was, and particularly the Puritans, were outraged by the influence of George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham, on the king of England, King James I, because George Villiers was not only advisor, but also the king's lover, which outraged the Puritans. Uh, king George Villiers was known as the groom of the stool, which assess, uh, assi who assisted the king with a lot of personal matters, including going to the bathroom. James I dies in 1625, and he's followed by his son, Charles I. It's during the reign of Charles I that this conflict between king and parliament will really come to a head quite violently. Charles I makes the same mistake that a lot of the Stuart monarchs make in that he marries a foreign Catholic princess. This is Henrietta Maria, who is a French princess, a devout Catholic, and sought through her influence on her husband to encourage him to accept Catholicism, which the king refuses, but clearly the Anglicanism, as demonstrated in the king's private worship, is clearly a heavily Catholic-influenced form of Anglicanism. To the Puritans of the day, the king's um, prescriptions for worship and liturgy certainly seem very close to Roman Catholicism, and they suspect his wife, being a devout Catholic and being a foreigner, uh, is paying in, playing in, do, undue influence on the king's worship. So the, Charles and his wife actually have one of the happier, more intimate marriages in royal history, and she bears him several children. The conflict comes to a head again in 1628 when Puritans, particularly um, as their power is growing in the parliament, submit another petition to the king. This is the petition of right, or the petition of the rights that common English men should enjoy, including the right to habeas corpus, that someone cannot be imprisoned indefinitely without being charged with something, that there can be no taxes without the parliament's consent, that there can be no quartering troops without the parliament's consent, and that the king cannot impose martial law, in other words, military rule, in times of peace. The response of the king to the petition of right is the same as what his father did. He rejects it, and he closes down the parliament. He dissolves the parliament, sends them all the members home, and as a result, with the disbandment of parliament, this leads to what we call the personal rule of Charles I. He rules by himself for 11 years, 1629 to 1640. No parliament, no voice in government for the English people, where gradually their resentments are growing against this king who seems to want to rule in a very absolutist manner. Now, violence will break out once the king, again, influenced by his wife and a form of high Anglicanism that looks like Catholicism, has his Archbishop of Canterbury, who's the lead bishop of the Anglican Church, send a new prayer book to be read in the churches of Scotland. Of course, Scotland, since the Reformation, has been a very conservative, traditional Presbyterian country. They reject the influence of bishops uh, and um, submit only to the authority of their presbyters or elders. And now this very Catholic-sounding prayer book is being forced upon them. And so when the local bishops imposed upon the Scots begin to read these prayer books, it leads to riots known as the Bishop's Wars. This is, of course, when very famously Jenny Geddes in St. Giles Cathedral throws her stool at the bishop uh, for reading this Catholic-sounding prayer book in her ears. So, because war is breaking out in Scotland, and now the Scots are massing an army to threaten to invade England, the king needs an army to meet the threat, 
But to have an army, you need to have money. To have money, you need taxes. To impose taxes, you need to have the parliament's consent. So now the king is forced to recall parliament, which meets in 1640. It will not stop meeting until 1660, although it looked very different. And now the parliament, as the king is asking them for money, says, we will give you the money in the form of tax revenue, but we sub submit another petition to you, known as the Grand Remonstrance of our demands for reform of the church and also reform of the parliament that you can no longer shut down parliament. The king refuses. He endeavors to arrest on the floor of the House of Commons members that he viewed as leaders of this rebellion. And as a result... The two sides cannot come together, and it leads to the English Civil War of 1642 to 1651. The two sides in the English Civil War are those that support the par power of the Parliament, are often Puritan, so in other words, they want to purify the church away from these Anglican, Catholic-sounding elements, nicknamed often the Roundheads because of the bowl cuts they received uh, for our haircuts. And the other side of the English Civil War, the Cavaliers, the Royalists, supporters of the King, supporters of Anglicanism. So these two sides that finally go to war in 1642. At the beginning of the war, the war does not go well for the parliamentary Puritan forces. They're outmatched, outgunned, outtrained, and overwhelmed by the King. The turning point in the war occurs with the creation of the new model army under the direction of Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell was a um, member of the gentry who um, often uh, served in Parliament, a very devout Puritan, and uh, he, realizing that the parliamentary forces would not be able to defeat the king's forces, he assembles his own army, known as the New Model Army, which is going to be a new standing army, that also often wears the red coat. This is the introduction of the red coat in for the British Army. And they score a major victory against the king's forces at the Battle of Naseby, defeating the king's forces. And this eventually signals the end of the Civil War and the victory of the Parliament over the king's forces. The question that is before the parliamentary forces is... Once you defeat the king, he's still king. So what do you do with him? Do you put him back on his throne? And so eventually, when the king doesn't really submit to his defeat and seems to be conspiring with foreign Catholic powers in order to regain his throne, the parliament decides to put the king on trial and charges him with high treason. This is the trial of the king in 1649. He is found guilty, and then he is publicly executed at Whitehall in 1649. Much to the support of the crowd initially, until the deed is actually done, and then there seems to be gasping and regret in response to this. In response to the king's execution, Thomas Hobbes, a popular English Political writer writes his famous Leviathan in which he advocates for a strong central government as the only true government, uh, which is far better than the chaos, which is he is witnessing in England now. The king has been executed. So with the removal of the king, it creates a power vacuum in England that Hobbes wants to fill with a strong absolutist government. We see the emergence of a lot of strange religious sects, uh, radical groups, including the Quakers during this time period in England. And so to meet the theological threat of all these diverse heresies that are emerging in England, the Puritans come together at Westminster, at Westminster Abbey and the Westminster Assembly and convene and write out what they believe. And that document is the Westminster Confession of Faith. So with the execution of the king, this leaves the parliament in charge of England. England is now a republic. It is led by, nominally, the, by the people. Not all the people get to vote. A lot of people don't get to vote in England. But there is a representative body to some degree. However, once the king is executed, it is clear that the parliament becomes quite comfortable and starts to rule a lot like the king. They don't call for new elections. They vote themselves pay raises and a lot of benefits were serving in Parliament, and they actually start to abuse their power and abuse their office, not totally unlike the king had 
before them. Waiting in the wings with the army marching in Ireland and Scotland is Oliver Cromwell. He is outraged by what he sees. He believes that the parliament, his fellow members of parliament, have betrayed the parliamentary cause, betrayed the true church and Puritan theology. And so as a result, he uses the power of the army to go back to London and to dissolve with his soldiers this parliament, dissolving parliament just like the king had before him. In response, now no parliament rules, and Oliver Cromwell creates what is called the Protectorate. This, in many ways, is really a military dictatorship, with Oliver Cromwell himself being Lord Protector of England. It's an interesting choose, uh, word choice, because Oliver Cromwell is offered the crown twice. He could have started a new dynasty, the Cromwell dynasty, at this point, but he refuses it twice. Instead, he believes that he is protecting England from authoritarian parliaments and also absolutist kings. And he's also seeking purification of the church and the triumph of the true church in Puritan theology. Oliver Cromwell's term as Lord Protector will only last, however, for about five years until uh, he dies in 1658. Um, this is his death mask, and he is buried with great pomp and celebration in Westminster Abbey initially. There are parliamentary forces that try to put Cromwell's son on um, as a replacement for his father as the second Lord Protector, but that effort really is in vain. And instead, the son of Charles I, who had escaped from England and fled to the continent, is now invited back to England in a very pivotal event known as the Restoration in 1660. The Restoration is the restoring of the English monarchy after the English Civil War, the execution of Charles I, and the Protectorate. So the monarchy is restored. There are popular outrages against Cromwell and the parliamentary forces. And so uh, leaders of the Civil War, including Cromwell himself, have their bodies exhumed, hanged, and then their heads placed on pikes uh, near Tower Bridge. So Charles II becomes the third Stuart monarch to rule in England, the son of Charles I. He is aware, of course, that his father had lost his head over attempts to assert absolute authority over England. Charles II, uh, during his time in France, certainly has Catholic sympathies, but he keeps those quiet because England, of course, is still officially an Anglican church, and he needs the support of the Parliament, even though they may be bit mad against the Puritans. Uh, they certainly, uh, the king certainly wants their support moving forward in his reign. His wife is also a foreign Catholic princess, Catherine of Braganza, a, a Portuguese princess. Uh, Charles II's court is known for his very dissolute lifestyle. He was very open with his mistresses. He has numerous children through his mistresses. He also opens up the theaters in London, which the Puritans had closed. And now in Parliament, even though there's a great desire to not see a, resum uh, a resumption of the English Civil War, we do see two groups that are really divided in England manifested in the Parliament, the Whigs and the Tories. The Whigs, in some ways, are the political and religious inheritors of the roundhead tradition, and the Tories are the political and religious inheritors of the Cavaliers. And so the two sides that were divided in the Civil War, roundheads and Cavaliers, now, in some extent, are expressed in the Parliament during the Restoration period. The Whigs supported more influence for the, power, for the Parliament. The Tories sought more influence and perhaps absolutism, for the king. Two very significant events during the reign of Charles II include an outbreak, a very severe outbreak of the plague, the bubonic plague in London in the 1660s. This is going to be one of the last large manifestations of the plague in those years um, and leads to a high death toll. Fortunately, the following year, we also have the significant event of the Great Fire of London. The Great Fire of London seems to have started in a bakery and it's very sp and spread very quickly to a lot of the wood uh, buildings of the city. 
much of the city of London burns, uh, but the the fortuitous part of the Great Fire of London is that it also burns away the plague, uh, which doctors at the time uh, really were ineffectual in stopping. Charles II, although he submits to the recommendations of the parliament frequently, it is clear that his time of exile as a child in France, in Louis XIV's France, had a profound influence on him. He's very attracted to Catholicism and very attracted to the French king as well. And so as a result, the Treaty of Dover is agreed upon in 1668 between the King of England and the King of France, in which Charles would receive £20,000 each year from Louis if he would agree to secretly convert to Roman Catholicism. Charles would provide Louis troops for his many wars. Now, this sparked some outrage in the Parliament because those troops sent from England to supply Louis for his wars were often directed against Protestant powers like the Dutch Republic. So the Treaty of Dover was very unpopular in England and is one more measure in, in, the, in the efforts of the Stuarts, it seems, to alienate the parliamentary forces. Finally, Jane, uh, Charles II dies in 1685, and it leads to the ascension of his brother, James II. James II is going to have a very short rule over England. He is very open about his desire to gain absolute control over England. He believes in absolutist monarchy, believes in the divide right of kings, he does not believe in the influence or the vote of parliaments, and he is very much a public Catholic and desires to see Roman Catholicism expand in England. In many ways, he is 100 years late because 100 years before the Elizabethan settlement had already settled this issue with the establishment of the Anglican Church. The only reason that the parliament permitted James II to come to the throne with his open support for absolutism and Roman Catholicism is that he they knew he was older and his wife is older and had no children and they assumed that indeed they would have no more children. So once James died, his niece would come to the throne, Mary, the wife of the Prince of Orange in the Netherlands, who was Protestant. So they looked at this as they needed to just endure this for a few years, and then he would pass. But unexpectedly, Mary of Modena, another foreign Catholic princess, married by a Stuart, gives birth unexpectedly. As a result, this opens up the possibility for an endless succession of Catholic monarchs in England. And so the Parliament, greatly scared by this prospect, essentially writes a letter to William, the Prince of Orange in the Netherlands, married to Mary, um, the niece of James II, to come and essentially invade England. So realizing he had lost popular support, King James II flees England, goes to the continent. William and Mary arrive in the event known as the Glorious Revolution. It is glorious, of course, because there is no bloodshed. It is a peaceful transition of power with the deposition of one king, him fleeing to the continent, and the arrival and installation of the next king, who is William, Prince of Orange. So this leads to the ascension of William III, King of England, and Mary II, the Queen of England, William and Mary. It is now completely clear in the settlement of their throne that they will be a limited monarchy, that they will submit to the decisions of Parliament and not regularly shut it down, and they also subscribe to what the Parliament quickly passes in the Bill of Rights. The English Bill of Rights is the statement passed by the Parliament clarifying what are the traditional rights of Englishmen, including no suspending of Parliament's laws, no levying of taxes without specific consent to the Parliament, freedom of speech for the parliament, and citizens may freely petition the king, no standing army in times of peace, and no excessive bail in royal courts. I want to finally mention, uh, now that we've concluded our study of the Stuarts, a very popular, very significant writer is operating during much of Restoration England, and that is John Bunyan. John Bunyan was a Baptist, Reformed Baptist preacher uh, who was not very well educated, and 
could not receive a license from the government to preach. He refuses to stop preaching, so he's confined to prison for many years of his life. During his time in prison, he writes one of the, the most popular uh, book written in the English language after the Bible, and that is The Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress is a story of a pilgrim named Christian who carries the burden of his sin, flees the city of destruction, and is on his way to the celestial um, city, uh, where he is finally, once he encounters the cross, alleviated of the burden of his sin, before, so he can continue on his journey all the way to the celestial city. A very popular devotional book in Protestant circles for several hundred years to come. And we could finally mention that Queen Anne is the last of the Stuarts, the sister of Queen Mary. She, um, shockingly, uh, is pregnant 18 times, but yet only has one child really survive um, infancy, and uh, that child dies uh, at a rather young age. And so despite 18 pregnancies, there is no heir to the throne. So the Stuarts, this will mark the end of the Stuart dynasty and the beginning of the Hanover dynasty with George I in the 18th century. Also during her reign, we see the Act of Union in which England and Scotland finally are put together in one country. Thus, we have the creation of what we can call Great Britain, England and Scotland, also including Wales. Later on, Northern Ireland will be incorporated to create the United Kingdom. The final part of this unit on absolutism we should discuss is a little bit of, about art. We see during the Reformation period um, very little artwork due to religious conflict and war. But we do see a small movement known as mannerism, known after the manner, the Italian manner. We see themes of anxiety and uncertainty, suffering, elongated figures, gloomy, dreadful pictures that really reflect the anxiety and the instability of religious war. El Greco is one of the more popular artists of this time period. Uh, we often see soldiers who look contemporary, even crucifying Christ, uh, representing the religious conflict of the time period. More popular, more significant, and widespread is Baroque artwork. Baroque emphasized very dramatic themes, power, grandeur, movement. It can be sensuous and, and reflect intense emotion. It's designed to generate a sense of awe. It's ornate, it can be lavish, and it's designed to emphasize the power of the king and his influence, drama, movement, that a strong king is needed to rescue the people uh, from religious conflict. We can also see it in the architecture and also some of the dramatic movements of the music. Uh, and in a different light, George Handel's uh, Messiah is also influential during this period as well. We also see another smaller uh, movement pr primarily in the Dutch Republic known as Dutch Realism. Dutch Realism emphasized realistic portrayals of everyday life. A lot of common individuals, not kings, not monks, not popes, not uh, famous individuals, but rather self-portraits, uh, people from everyday life. Uh, such as the popular work, The Girl with the Pearl uh, Earring, or Landscapes of the Dutch Countryside, or A Lady Writing a Letter, or a Milkmaid, um, or a Common Nobleman. And the point of this art was to reflect individuality, also um, the priesthood of all believers, the individual's ability to encounter God without the aid of a priest, or of an established church. It is very much Protestant art in that sense. Rembrandt van Rijn is also a very popular artist of this period who painted biblical scenes, including the handwriting on the wall, Christ on the Sea of Galilee, and the risen Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene, and his most famous work being The Return of the Prodigal from 1633.